molt bona tarda i gràcies a totes i a tots per venir avui a escoltar Ariela Zulai. La veritat és que és una d'aquelles ocasions especials perquè Ariela representa per moltes i molts dels que esteu aquí no només una escriptura sinó una posició molt precisa elaborada a partir dels debats sobre la fotografia però també un exemple de com ha pogut transcendir la fotografia i l'anàlisi de la fotografia cap a una espècie de filosofia política o, com ara ha arribat a ser el cas, una anàlisi del que ella anomena del que ella anomena un règim imperial. Com sabeu, a Mariola estem preparant un projecte, una exposició que obrirà a meitat d'octubre aquest any i que de moment porta el títol de Fe de Rata amb la idea d'esmenar-li la plana a certs relats imperials que s'han construït precisament amb l'ajuda de la fotografia com un instrument de captura, d'extracció i d'expropiació. I en concret presentarem vuit projectes que toquen des del llarg conflicte a Palestina, entre ells, Palestina i Israel, amb sèries com Unshowable Photographs, una sèrie que ella elabora a partir de, no dic la descoberta, però sí de la troballa d'unes fotografies a l'arxiu de la Creu Roja a Suïssa, un arxiu que representa com els palestins no van marxar dels seus territoris de manera voluntària, sinó amb una certa violència, però que són unes fotos que no obstant s'utilitzen per presentar aquell esdeveniment com un abandonament voluntari dels territoris palestins. Unes fotos que ella no va obtenir el permís per poder utilitzar, per poder comentar, i el que va fer va ser dibuixar-les i exposar-les, diguéssim, amb aquesta mena de traducció o altra versió que especifica i dona informació de quina és la seva posició, no hi ha respecte a aquelles imatges, sinó a la possibilitat d'utilitzar un arxiu com aquest, el de la Creu Roja. Mostrarem altres projectes com The Natural History of Rape, un treball absolutament necessari on ella examina un fet que és la constatació que a l'acabar la Segona Guerra Mundial a les ciutats alemanyes i sobretot a Berlín es donen milers de violacions de dones que alguns llibres d'història recullen, però dels que no hi ha ni una fotografia. Llavors, això la presenta en ella amb un problema molt específic, que és el que ella anomena untaken photographs, fotos que no s'han pres, però d'esdeveniments que sabem que han tingut lloc. Aquesta espècie de impotència, ella l'acaba transformant en una capacitat política per constituir arxius i per, d'alguna manera, donar carta d'existència a esdeveniments discutibles i debatibles. Presentarem altres projectes com una crítica a la Carta Universal dels Drets Humans i, sobretot, una sèrie de treballs en els que ella ha estat implicada més recentment que analitzen la asimetria de la circulació que compararia, diguéssim, la circulació dels objectes etnogràfics extrets d'un continent com l'Africà durant els períodes colonials, imperials, i la circulació de les persones avui en dia. En resum, ella planteja utilitzar aquests objectes que avui en dia tenim a museus com el Museu de les Cultures del Món, aquí a Barcelona, o el Quai Brandi a París, o a altres museus d'aquesta mena, utilitzar aquests objectes com a passaports globals per allò que aquest dematí el principal encarregat de Ciutat Refugi, de l'oficina que va sonar, ens deia que eren els irregulars, aquelles persones que arriben i no són refugiats, no són migrants, no són res, no tenen papers. Per tant, convertir aquells objectes que els pertanyien a les seves cultures, amb els que estaven lligats i dels que van ser 
expropiats, convertir-los en passaports globals que els donen indrets quan estan aquí. Per tant, el treball d'Ariela està movent-se més enllà de la fotografia cap a tota una sèrie de conflictes i de problemes pels quals la paraula arxiu, la paraula fotografia ha quedat petita. Però no obstant, és un discurs que emergeix d'aquests debats. Voldria, per fer una presentació més ortodoxa d'Ariela, hauríem de dir que ella és professora del que es diu Modern Culture and Media and Comparative Literature a la Universitat de Brown, des de fa uns sis anys, quan deixa Israel. Per tant, que ningú gosi dir que ella és israelita, renuncia a aquesta possessió que l'estat d'Israel en fa de les persones que hi han nascut i activament, d'alguna manera, es desmarca, és a dir, surt d'aquesta subjecció i, per tant, podem dir que ve d'Israel, però no que és israelita. Ha publicat llibres que molts de vosaltres coneixeu. Jo crec que el gran impacte el va fer un llibre com The Civil Contract of Photography, publicat per Zonebooks l'any 2009, i és arran d'aquest llibre que ens vam conèixer. I com sabeu, Ariela no és la primera vegada que exposa o presenta el seu treball a Barcelona. L'any 2009 la vaig incloure en un projecte titulat Antifotoperiodisme i va portar ni més ni menys que un treball titulat Act of the State, és a dir, on analitza les fotografies que mostren les trobades entre palestins i l'exèrcit israelià o israelians i veure quin tipus de ciutadania està en conflicte allà. Però té altres llibres com The Civil Imagination o també From Palestine to Israel, A Photographic Record of Destruction and State Formation i un llibre que també a mi em va almenys impressionar i em va servir que és The One State Condition, escrit amb Adi Ophir, que és filòsof polític. Però ella també es presenta com a realitzadora de films, comissària de projectes que impliquen l'arxiu, i per tant ara ens trobem amb una dificultat i és com anomenar-la, és una autora, és una artista, jo què seré, el comissari d'una persona que es presenta com a comissària, Bé, en definitiva, jo crec que això ens posa un repte interessant sobre el nou repartiment de tasques i de models de funcionament que tenim en aquest àmbit i per això és tan interessant escoltar-la i que ens expliqui les motivacions més recents en la seva recerca. A banda d'acabar, agraïm-li que hagi vingut, que hagi acceptat per primera vegada reunir aquests projectes que ell ha anat presentant un a un, que ho farem a la tardor, i que vindrà acompanyat també d'un seminari. Us prego que esteu atents, que aneu mirant la nostra web, crec que serà un altre moment oportú per poder acompanyar-la en la seva recerca. Hem de dir que aquest és un projecte, tant l'exposició, aquesta conferència, com els seminaris, com les recerques que l'acompanyen, finançat íntegrament per un projecte europeu, From Culture to Conviviality, que té un anagrama que és 4-6, on hi ha 10 socis que ara no m'entendré a esmentar. Però crec que és important dir-ho perquè tothom sapiguem que aquests projectes ja no s'alimenten només del que ens donen les administracions, sinó que Europa és una dimensió important perquè puguem continuar treballant i fent projectes com aquest d'Ariela. I sobretot les gràcies a vosaltres per estar aquí, alguns dels quals i els quals heu estat durant dues hores abans compartint també les vostres pròpies recerques i esperem que s'hagi obert, diguéssim, el canal per poder treballar junts. Agrair també a Núria Soler, que està ajudant a coordinar aquest gran projecte amb a Mariela, tot l'acompanyament, perquè és un projecte especial, és un projecte que ens exigeix el contacte amb comunitats, amb persones com vosaltres, que esteu també fent recerques en punts molt concomitants amb el que a Ariela li preocupa. And now, the floor is yours, Ariela. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that I am with this. Uh, okay, so uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, 
I'm sure that everything that you heard is the right thing, but I didn't understand not a word because some words are more uh, uh, they have they are easily migrating from one language to another, so I don't know. Uh, 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 how to uh, uh, continue what Carlos said exactly, but I'm sure that he presented the project that we are uh, working on to uh, be presented here in October uh, as an exhibition, a kind of uh, 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 accumulation of different projects, archives and visual essays that I worked on in the last couple of years and that uh, sum up together to the exhibition that will be here and the book that will be published approximately at the same time, Potential History, sorry, Unlearning, uh, Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism, it's subtitle. So what I'm going to present tonight is uh, some uh, ideas from the book, uh, uh, some ideas about what does it mean to unlearn imperialism because we are living under the imperial regime, and democracies are part of, you know, the vehicles through which the uh, imperial structures are reproduced. So I'm going to present something that is related to the book and to some of the projects that you will see here. I hope that you will come in October to see them in their uh, exhibition form. Uh, so uh, let me start. Uh, political philosophers often talk about democratic regimes that appeared in the late 17th century, the beginning of 18th century, in Netherlands, in England, in the US, in France, as a renewal of a Greco-Roman forms. Like Marx said, democracies with Roman dresses and Roman phrases. Um, despite recurring invocation of the ancient regimes in the political rhetoric of the time, this claim by Marx and by others, is historically and theoretically groundless. So what I'm trying to propose, that this is the wrong way to think about our democracies as the reenactment of uh, uh, those regimes. This uh, uh, idea ignores the crucial role of the new ways in which the body politics was reconstituted from the first days of uh, imperial expansion uh, out of Europe. And the notion of the body politic is the notion that I would like to dwell on today. The body politic with imperialism is associated with the body of citizens, but the body politic is really the body of the governed people. So I will try to articulate this idea, and I consider the body politic really the site through which we have to understand our political regimes. Uh, I argue that the imperial manufacturing of the body politic should be granted a constitutive place at the origins of modern uh, democracy. Modern democracies uh, uh, manipulated this body, but it was not manipulated only by the regimes top down. It is all the time also responded by people's you know, uh, uh, ways of uh, 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 running away from certain regimes, other people who are welcoming them. In this case, you know, I just took this uh, uh, photograph in the morning in the municipality here in Barcelona, you know, about the willingness of people to, uh, uh, get, uh, to get against their governments or their uh, similar governments when they want to let people who do not belong to their body politics in their eyes uh, uh, to drone in the sea. And when I'm saying in their eyes, I'm speaking about, you know, this kind of uh, 500 years from 1492 till today in order to understand this question of the body politic. Because those people who are uh, being left to drown in the sea or are rescued sometimes or being kept in the city under uh, uh, humiliating categories like irregular, and I uh, got you uh, <laughs> saying that out of uh, everything that I didn't understand, so these uh, categories are part of what shape the body politics. So this is really the constitutive issue of the question of democracy. Uh, the body politic is not one of the components of a political regime, but rather a site of violence through which what I propose to call imperial democracies, rather than simply democracies as we speak, and then we associate them to different idyllic models, 
were constituted. This process had started in the 15th century as overseas invasions inaugurated this manufacture of a body politic and have not ceased since. And just very briefly, uh, uh, to give an example, when colonists went here or there, even though colonialism in the eyes of historians didn't start yet, it is associated with the late 19th century, when uh, uh, colonists went here and there and started to intervene in the status of local people and to rearrange them under different categories in relation to their local politics in different places in Europe, we are already attending what I'm calling the manufacture of body politic. When Hannah Arendt discusses the term word alienation, she associates it not only with the discovery of new lands, but also with the discovery of Earth itself. Uh, and let me read from Hannah Arendt and uh, showing you what, it, what does she mean when she speaks about the Earth as a manipulable place where we can intervene in it, not only in specific lands, but in its uh, destiny altogether. The discovery of the Earth, the mapping of her lands, and the chartering of her waters took many centuries and has only now begun to come to an end. Only now men taken full possession, now she speaks about what she calls modernity. Only now men taken full possession of his mortal dwelling place and gather the infinite horizons which here te uh, temptingly, uh, which were temptingly and forbiddingly open to all previous ages. So what she says here is really very important to understand this notion that I'm proposing as the manufacturer of the body politic, because you know mapping different places was technology that was available prior to 1492, but it had limits. It had some you know lines of sacredness. You cannot violate them. So if these technologies were there, what happened with modernity is that there was no uh, barrier for violation of others' words. And uh, uh, this is exemplifies in this kind of understanding of the earth as something that you can really grasp it. And if you can really grasp it, it means that you can take scissors and start to cut lands, to uh, 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 split people, to partition uh, uh, peoples from uh, one from another, etc. When discussing this term, world alienation, Hannah Arendt emphasizes the role which distances play in transforming the human capacity to survey territories and subsequently destroy the life worlds inhabiting them. Any decrease of territorial distance, she writes, can be won only at the price of putting a decisive distance between man and earth, of alienating man from his immediate earthly surrounding. And let me dwell briefly on this all these technologies that are, we are being offered to uh, bridge the gap, to go uh, over distances, what they create is a different distance, she argues. And this different distance is what she calls world alienation, which means that people can really look at these kind of you know, places and say, wow, this is an empty place. We can now send a uh, few people to extract what is out there. So if we want to deeply understand the political regimes under which we live today, we have to understand how you know, the mapping of Earth as a totality is crucial in this process, in the way that we can, uh, in, through different patterns of alienation, think that what is out there is for us to take. In the case of other territories, this tension between distance and proximity went uh, through an additional reversal. The cities, cultures, objects, natural resources, ways of life, rituals, artisanal skills were so overwhelm overwhelmingly rich, different, and unfamiliar that an undeniable distance awaited imperial actors rather than proximity. So when imperial actors went to different places, they thought that they are breaching the gap, that they are there. And all of a sudden they encounter cultures that they don't understand, cultures that resist their presence, cultures that they cannot grasp in this kind of facility that uh, 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 the modern imagination let us believe in. 
So let me dwell uh, very briefly on this example. This is example from the book uh, uh, by Susserberg about uh, 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 cases Shefal, uh, Kaz Shefal's culte of Mapenda people. So, uh, the book is from 1955. And what intrigues me is that he took this photograph. The object today is in uh, uh, Hervorn Museum in Africa Museum in Belgium, and uh, uh, he was completely conscious of the fact that the left hand, uh, this one, holding the cup, and you don't see the cup, right, uh, was almost intentionally broken almost everywhere to avoid explanations. So what we see here, not in 1492, in 55, because this is why I'm trying to uh, insist that this project is an, an ongoing, that imperialism is an ongoing enterprise. Uh, uh, local people knew that uh, their secrets are always threatened by the presence of colonizers. So wherever he saw this kind of sculpture, he realized that the left hand is broken in order to avoid you know, these kind of uh, uh, interrogations. Uh, this kind of a uh, bon volonté to understand the others. And just let me show another example that is also relevant to uh, photography. Uh, these are, uh, this is an image that was taken by Robert Hotot, uh, who was uh, a French anthropologist. And uh, uh, as you see here, uh, the sculptures are being presented, displayed to the gaze, displayed to the camera, and uh, uh, he's here coming outside of this hut, but let me read uh, uh, what he writes. The figure, and he's speaking about these figures. The figure was clothed in ample red robes, fixed at the neck. We removed its garments to get a photograph of the carving because they were interested in the carving, which means they were interested in removing obstacles to see what they were looking for, which is the carving. Having taken my photograph, I realized that the village, which previously had been very animated, was hushed and deserted. But we were being observed from behind the huts. All of a sudden, something happened when he took his camera and violated the sculptures. The village was deserted. Uh, 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 we were observed from behind by, uh, the huts by a few of the villagers who kept their distance. We reclothe the figure and return it uh, to its ritual place. And just to give you very briefly uh, two other examples that I presented them yesterday at the university, so I'll do it very briefly because I recognize uh, some of the faces here. Uh, these are two pages from Paris Match. What you have here is a woman, African woman, looking at uh, a sculpture at the occasion of uh, uh, the Dakar exhibition in 66. And the caption says, until today, women uh, who see these fetishes are punished with this. So not only the object was looted and was kept in European museums and now was landed to uh, the car uh, exhibition in 66 only for a short time and will be recuperated, but, uh, and the looting was a looting, looting of a sacred object. This sacred object is re-exposed now in Africa in the car, and the woman uh, uh, whose life is threatened by death is uh, being captured in a photograph as if uh, something will either happen to her or uh, uh, there is a moment of ridiculizing this kind of belief that something will, will happen to her. But either way, what we are, are attending to is the violation of other people's belief about their objects, about their cosmology, and uh, uh, about the way that objects should exist not on the walls of museums. And this is another image, but I'll skip it. Or I'll let you look at it uh, uh, yourself. This distance, and the distance is created, you know, if the object is sacred, if uh, the hand of the object is being broken, which means we put a barrier, don't go farther, this distance is disrespected, the distance could, that could uh, not be abolished without further violence was often transgressed and violated. These invasions jeopardized the, life, the lived, re, lived reality of disparate societies whose body politic consisted, as it is implied by the term, of all the people living in a specific place. So uh, just let me move to the next image which is an image from Palestine from 48, and exemplifying through this image, 
Uh, what does it mean to manipulate the body politic? This is an image from uh, Tiberia uh, 48, uh, and uh, uh, the Jewish forces, what became Israel, they expelled 750,000 uh, Palestinians from Palestine, destroyed Palestine, and created uh, a nation state called Israel. And uh, there are still you know, many arguments among historians uh, was there any order from above for the expulsion of 750,000 people? And I find it completely ridiculous when I'm looking at photographs to ask this question because it's enough to look at the images and to see how much the expulsion was organized. So this is one example, there are many others where you see that the population is divided, men, old people and children on the one side and, uh, sorry, women, children, and older men on the one side, and uh, uh, able bodies of young men on the other side. So you see how expulsion was run through different phases, and photography tells us much more than those documents allegedly concealed or hidden in the archive that we don't necessarily need them to confirm what can be reconstructed outside of images. They transform the body politic into a manipulable object exposed to both physical and symbolic operation through which people could be added and subtracted, displaced and relocated in separation from the objects among which they are used to live and the cultural and spiritual infrastructures that sustain them. And this is something that is very important to my work to understand patterns of forced migration together with patterns of forced migration of objects. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, expropriation of people from their objects is always an opportunity to exploit them more, either to transform them into only manual workers, or to transform them into refugees, or uh, irregulars, or asylum seekers, etc. And uh, uh, these operations of the manipulation of the body politic takes place uh, under different, there are different aspects to this manipulation of the body politic. And I would like to very briefly present five uh, 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 such procedures. Uh, this is another photograph from Palestine. Here again, you see the, uh, 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 the organization of expulsion. Uh, and just before I pre I'll present the five general uh, 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 operations that are not necessarily uh, pertain only to Palestine. They, are, uh, uh, they pertain to the entire uh, imperial projects. I don't want to leave uh, uh, this expulsion as if it is only the way that the state expelled uh, Palestinians. Palestinians are constantly claiming their right to return. And here you see an image from 2011, but in the last year, there is a constant nonviolent uh, march of return uh, 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 where Israel separates itself from uh, Gaza. So let me present these five uh, 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 procedures or uh, uh, operations that are uh, constitutive of the manipulation of the body politic. So the first one is the destruction of local taxonomies and systems of rights. As I have already shown in the first images when I show the violation of uh, 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 the meaning of objects, we can see it in a more systematized way. Here, for example, this is an image of uh, uh, 100 objects that were presented to the costume in uh, the US in 36 before this exhibition, uh, African uh, Negro Art, the Museum of Modern Art, curated by uh, Sweeney. And uh, what you have here are objects that were collected from, uh, collected that were plundered from different places in Africa. Uh, they dwelled for several times in private or public collections. And for the occasion of the exhibition, they were gathered together. And rather than looking at them only as objects or objects of art or objects for, uh, that are given now to the gaze of the costume inspection, I'm looking at these objects as objects that are still related to the communities from which they were extracted, which means that I'm related, relating to these objects as objects in which not only that should be restituted, but objects in which the rights of people are still inscribed. And I will come back to it uh, uh, later. 
But what we see here is how all these objects that were extracted from their communities were, you know, like we heard in the quotation from Robert Hotot, everything was removed from them. People were removed from them. Textiles that covered them were, were removed from them. Everything was removed from them in order for us to be shaped as museum uh, uh, audience and to recognize the pure value of each and every object. And I was interested by this image that was not the way that the uh, objects were shown in the exhibition, every object separately. But here, by coincidence, we see a community. Rather than community mixed of objects and people, we see a community of objects. It was created for costume purposes, but nonetheless we can recall, we can be reminded through this image of this idea that objects are not discrete objects that has a, a market value uh, that is determined by Sotheby's or uh, other uh, auction houses, but objects are part of what constitute a community, parts of what enable a community to uh, recognize itself and to be protected by its objects. Uh, just another uh, uh, gesture similar uh, in relation to the museum. These are four frames from the film by Alain René and uh, Chris Marker from 63. Statue also die. I'm working now on a film project about looted objects in different museums and I am arguing against this title, Statue also die, because statue do not die. Statue are murdered. So what I'm trying to do in the film is try to account for this murder of uh, 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 sculptures, or not only sculptures. And let me quote from their film. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, it's available to everybody. When men die, they enter history, as a matter of fact, as if history was a container where we enter. When statue die, they enter art, as if, again, art was a container where it's sure that every object should enter. This botany of death is what we call culture. So let me move from the destruction of local taxonomies because you know when you see this kind of community of objects that are denuded from their communities, we see a different taxonomy that was imposed on these objects because those objects were part of a different taxonomy. So let me move from the destruction of local taxonomies and their replacement with other taxonomies to avoidance of accountability. Um, so uh, uh, these violent and unjust modes of destruction are made to avoid accountability, intervention in, and erasure of the meaning of these, uh, that these procedures required. They were translated into books of law and authorized institutions such as archives, museums, and libraries to administer the status of new orders as progressive phases comparing to previous eras. And I would like to illustrate this with this image from uh, uh, the UNESCO exhibition from 1950 of human rights, an attempt to illustrate human rights. So what you have here is a, a sculpture that is in the Louvre. And of course, I don't have to repeat myself. Uh, it is clear that it was plundered. And uh, we are speaking about Hammurabi, king of Babylon, and I'm quoting from uh, here, who reigned sometimes after 2000 before Christ, drew up a code of laws based on a system of retribution which was harsh, unjust, and rigid. Since that day, justice has made great progress. So, of course, everything that was plundered is uh, uh, now catalogued or classified in this kind of progressive time. And, of course, those who create this exhibition, those who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after they participated in the destruction of the world, will put themselves as the higher uh, phase in the progressive history. Just what they do not re remind is that this uh, object is now in the Louvre and this is part of their very, I would say, uh, 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 system of retribution uh, which was harsh, unjust and rigid and uh, uh, avoided accountability until today as it's just enough to visit the museums in these cities, in other cities, to understand that accountability is still not even on the table as a possibility. And I would like to move to the third uh, 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 procedure, the expropriation of local populations' wealth. 
and uh, 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 many of the uh, uh, objects that were looted from Africa left behind them these kind of uh, 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 destroyed, devastated places where, you know, the uh, uh, wealth, the local wealth, local resources were extracted. This is an image from before uh, uh, the creation of what is called the Free State of Leopold II, and this is in the midst of uh, this operation. These are a few more uh, uh, images from Robert Hotot, where you see, you don't see the objects that he extracted and today can be uh, seen in Paris, in the Musée de l'Homme, and in Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. But what you see are the uh, 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 cases with which these objects were uh, 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 displaced. You see the people who carried them, uh, 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 cheap labor or free labor that was extracted from people. So the extraction is really on different levels, and the objects of art are just the ice, uh, the tip of the iceberg uh, of what we, uh, uh, we have to understand. And I would like to move to the fourth point, which is uh, the mass rape of uh, women. And I will uh, exemplify this through this image. What we see here is an image of a photographer uh, in the middle. He is holding his camera. He is really ready to take a photograph. But what we see is another photographer taking the persona of the photographer in the photograph, which means that what we are looking at is really an interest in the persona of the photographer in Berlin 45. But we see another, or we don't see, but we have to assume and the presence of a third photographer, the one who took the photograph that we are looking at, right? So in one single photograph, we have three cameras. And in the same time, in this city, we are speaking about the rape of between one million and two million women uh, uh, by the different liberating armies who were part of creating the New World Order or were part of drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So what we see here is the presence of cameras, but the absence of images of rape. So this is a question that I'm trying to address in one of the projects that I will show here in October. So here what you see is one of the ways that I'm trying to address it. I'm trying to uh, address the question from different perspectives. One of them is to call to see the uh, coexistence of the cameras and rape in the same space and to call us to think about photography not reducible to what is seen in the photograph, not just to representations, but to think about photography in a more complex way, but I will not dwell on it now. I will just show this intervention, which is very Malevich intervention of the black square, but the black square is an attempt to reconstruct out of these books that address the question of 45, but do not address uh, seriously the question of rape, to take out of them the few lines that they have about rape of women and to make these lines into captions of untaken photographs. And untaken photographs are exactly what you hear by them, is a category that I'm using in my archives, is photographs that could have been taken. You saw how many cameras were there. There were many more than the three. And the caption reads, untaken photograph, May 45, Berlin. Uh, uh, women carry a wounded woman uh, to the hospital so uh, she can receive medical assistance after being raped. So this is a line from the book, from one of the books that I'm studying. And uh, uh, I put a black square because there is no photograph. A photograph that I was able somehow to match to such a situation is this one, but I cannot confirm that this is the situation that the woman is raped in this photograph because I don't have much more information about it, but I'm not looking to match these captions with images. This is just to illustrate that there is an effort to confirm these uh, 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 with images, but I'm more interested in putting into this kind of literature to put placeholders of untaken photographs and to use what we know about these rapes as captions for images that anyhow we don't want to see. I don't want to see two million torn bodies of women. But I don't want to see their uh, rape disappearing from the archive. So there is a question here how to intervene in the archive to make this uh, mass rape present, not only for the sake of remembering the mass rape of German women, but understanding what I'm trying to persuade you that take place is that democracies are built on these five procedures that I'm trying to show and the creation of each and every 
uh, uh, democracy in the last 500 years was based on mass rape of women. It's true for India, Pakistan. It's true for the US and Native Americans. It's true for uh, uh, the US in the context of slavery. It's true for uh, uh, Israel and Palestine. It's true for Germany post-World War II. So it is not one episode. It is constitutive. I don't know enough about your history, but I'm hoping that you will do the work uh, uh, or that you di already did the work, so I'm hoping to learn from you about this. And the last uh, uh, procedure that is crucial to uh, the manipulation of uh, the body politic is, uh, um, um, is the differentiation uh, between people uh, and forcing them to embody different statuses, and the different statuses are uh, 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 refugees, asylum seekers, uh, irregular, uh, illegal workers, and on and on and on. Uh, and just let me also tie it to an image and tie it to an image uh, uh, from Spain of, uh, in relation to the Spanish uh, colonialism and to tie it to the system of the castes. That is uh, 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 the typification, the create, creation of types that is equivalent to what we see in the modern state, the creation of these political uh, statuses. Um, so imperial invasions and expeditions uh, with variable aims destroyed multiple worlds in conquered lands. I'm using world in the Hannah Arendt sense, an environment of durable and solid human artifice, which had been shaped across generations, not instantly, like the New World Order, when cities were destroyed in order to let the market create the new structures. So we're speaking about, I'm speaking about world in the Hannah Arendt understanding of something that is created throughout generations. Uh, these resources, uh, the resources of those places which were under imperial domination and colonial rule for centuries continue to be extracted to the, to the benefit of other places and other people, while the colonized regions have become sites of humanitarian aid. The humanitarian aid framework is part of an orchestrated amnesia that renders imperial, uh, imperial and colonial crimes unaccountable and turn imperial agents, uh, the major actors in dominating the meaning of rights through international humanitarian laws and international organizations. Common histories and theories of rights facilitate the substitution of accountability for imperial and political crimes with a duty of a sort, duty that is defined usually as a moral uh, duty to extend rights to formally uh, colonized populations or to uh, uh, backward populations. The rights in questions are implicated in and crafted according to imperial agendas that insist upon propagating them to other people, as in the famous case of the Pon Napoleonic Wars following the French Revolution. And here is an image of Napoleon standing at the entrance of the mosque in Cairo. And as you uh, all know, uh, through Edward Said and through other sources, uh, Egypt was uh, heavily plundered uh, by uh, uh, the Napoleonic War and the uh, British expeditions and on and on. But I'm bringing this image now in uh, a slightly different context. We are speaking about the French Revolution, one of the moments that is considered wrongly in political theory as the emergence of uh, uh, the discourse of freedom and human rights and uh, what happens immediately after the French Revolution that brought us our uh, 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 dubious citizenship is the wars that were uh, meant to bring this notion of freedom to other places without, of course, doing anything in relation to uh, 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 centuries of colonialism, in relation to rights that were expropriated from people, and, of course, uh, slavery. So the Napoleonic Wars that are... Uh, 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 generated so many resources of others as part of the French patrimony or British patrimony uh, also propagated this idea of freedom which is tied to uh, uh, the subjugation of other people. These rights that were uh, 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 
that emerged with the 18th century uh, revolutions uh, have a textual existence and their origin is located in what became canonical documents of rights. Advoca advocates of human rights who think and act within this imperial legacy are often oblivious to the fact that this narrative is yet another instantiation of imperial violence in which they actively participate under different forms, scholars, experts, professional subjects, uh, or citizens. I propose to relate to these rights that are written here, and you cannot read them now because it's too, they're too small, but you know them. It's the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. I propose to relate to this type of rights uh, uh, as rights that have no world because they are textual uh, and they are not emerging from a community, but they are written on documents that are preserved in archives, that are preserved uh, in relation to objects that are preserved in museums, etc., etc. So I propose to call them rights without words or textual rights. And I propose to relate to them as one type of rights, not as uh, uh, the rights. And I propose to relate to two other forms of rights. One of them is what I call imperial rights. And among imperial rights, I'm including the right to craft this declaration of rights. Because in what you already saw in previous images, we saw the destruction of different places. When places are destructed, are destroyed, when objects are removed, and communities are being exposed to more violence, the rights, the system of rights that were there are destroyed too. So the right to write the rights for other people and to distribute them to other places, these are imperial rights. So rather than looking at this declaration and reading the textual rights, let's remind ourselves that in this declaration, this declaration is the performance of another set of rights, which are the imperial rights, the rights to write the rights for other people, or the rights to destroy their worlds and then to bring a text to organize this world. And by destroying these worlds and creating new worlds and providing these kind of texts, people are losing different types of protection, protection that they had when they roam around in their communities, protection that they had when they uh, were moving in recognized familiar environment. Imagine Egypt after, you know, uh, uh, the destruction that Napoleon uh, brought to Egypt. People are completely disoriented. Let alone 5,000 people were killed because they were resisted to this uh, appropriation. So I'm speaking also about uh, 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 imperial rights as the rights to create the rights for others. And let me illustrate it through another image. We're going back to the map or to the globe with which I started earlier. Here you see a, a, a French empire in blue. And what you have is what uh, Franz Fanon called Frenchmen speaking to Frenchmen. So rather than, you know, different sports, kind of an ideal model of globalization, we are speaking about Frenchmen imposing Frenchness on other places, whatever is Frenchness, they invent it on the way, but they are imposing what they invent on the way on other places, and what we have is a map of uh, global uh, France. So I will uh, skip a few other things that I wanted to say about uh, imperial rights, and I would like to move to the third category of rights that I'm proposing. So I'm speaking about textual rights that have no world, but they have words, they have text. I'm speaking about imperial rights, the right to uh, 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 shape the worlds for others that we inhabited. We, and now I'm speaking about a we, not we Spanish because I'm not, not we Catal Catalans because I'm not, but we as kind of scholars, museum goers, citizens of different places, we inherited those rights. We can come with ideas for other places, what would be good for them, how to train them, how to educate them, how to bring to them different projects. So we are inheritors of these rights. And I would like to move to the last uh, 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 category of rights uh, that I spoke about, and it is the category of disabled rights. These are rights that were put out of action, and I call them disabled because they were put out of action, with the destruction of the physical worlds in which they were affected and in which people's place was recognized. 
Recognition of one's place was not necessarily and never only mediated and validated through papers and always included objects, ceremonies, rituals, food habits, orders, genealogies, skills, and traditions. I propose to relate to these rights as disabled rights rather than destroyed rights uh, uh, for two reasons. First, this kind of rights inscribed in common words cannot fully be taken from people as long as they continue to participate in building new worlds in which a minimum of rights is always inscribed. Second, the rights which have disabled can potentially be re-enabled and this is what people are claiming under different forms. And just when we are looking again at this image, just think about, you know, not only about Macron, uh, French president, or uh, invited this kind of uh, generous report to restitute objects. Think how much work was done for people to call for the restitution of objects from different uh, uh, communities. So people are claiming their rights constantly and they are inscribing their rights in uh, different places, but I will not dwell on it more. I would like to show it through two, three other images. One of them is an image of what I call counter expedition and I relate to uh, what is called migration crisis, not as a crisis, uh, not as a crisis. First of all, it's not the, uh, it's all of a sudden it happened. We are speaking about 500 years of forced migration. So every place that feel like there are too many immigrants, they call it a crisis. And second, we are speaking about counter expedition in the sense that people who are looking uh, for what will be their places where they want, where they want, where they are forced to be, uh, uh, to look for different places for, to locate themselves, they are actually performing a counter expedition because they are claiming their rights in those uh, uh, former empires. So rather than calling them uh, just immigrants that are coming from nowhere, they are uh, uh, performing very minimal, but nonetheless existent, modality of reparation and I would like to show this idea of rights that people are all the time creating in their worlds because we cannot live in the world without rights. Those UN rights are completely, I mean, they're completely unrelated to, to our world. This is uh, 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 in the uh, 18 uh, arrondissement in Paris, the 18 district in Paris, uh, this is the place where the Roma people are living and unfortunately they are all the time uh, under threat. But what you see here is the way that people created their rights. It is clear who lives where. It is clear what is the public and what is the private domain. You see our rights are, must be in common. Rights are not private property of anyone. Rights is something that organizes the, the space that we share together. And their space is constantly threatened because they are not just migrants. They created very poor, but nonetheless, they created a fabric of life that protect them more than the Universal Declaration of Rights can protect them. And just to put it in opposition to the conception of uh, organization, uh, 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 humanitarian organization, how they conceive this inst instant uh, uh, attempt to create an uh, environment. So here you have a model that was created by humanitarian uh, NGOs and IKEA for uh, uh, the better uh, life of refugees, which is of course the negation of worldliness, the negation of the fact that people are living among others, that people are living, so they create, they inhabit their world. Here what you have is the same idea that you know, was shaped through, uh, since 1492 we come, we destroy, and we bring new taxonomy. So here is the uh, new taxonomy. Uh, understanding this interconnectedness and this role is crucial in envisaging the reversal of imperial rights from the right to, the right to conquer other places, the right to give rights to other places. Its reversal is what I'm trying to advocate and its reversal is the right not to the right not to be a perpetrator, the right not to be part of colonial projects, and the right to disown, rather than thinking about restitution as another charity project, uh, to think about uh, disowning the objects that were looted as the first step 
to create other modalities of interaction with people from whom they were expropriated because the debt will not be uh, some zero when the objects will be restituted. Five years of uh, imperial crimes cannot be erased in one gesture. A major purpose of this reversal is to envisage the emergence of a variety of calls for restitution, reparations, and decolonized uh, uh, spatial imagination, enabling communities to regain proximity to their objects and reversal from the hairs of uh, the inheritors of imperial rights as a mode of redrawing from privileges by claiming the right not to have those privileges. There is a lot of work to be done by all of us as uh, enjoying uh, a certain amount of privileges. In order to do so, we must modulate our focus, turning it away from the way imperial violence is inscribed in the bodies of victims, mainly colonized groups and individuals, and towards the way it is exercised by citizens in less obvious sites, such as museums and archives. So what I'm trying to suggest when I'm connecting uh, uh, patterns of forced migration of objects and people, what I'm trying to suggest is rather than uh, 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 waiting for another image of uh, 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 the body of the victim that will always be the same, the non-white uh, victims, uh, in this imaginary, in this humanitarian Im imaginary, to uh, 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 think about museum as, as sites of violence, as sites where we can recognize what we are looking for, what we are expected to recognize in uh, the images of victims, let's recognize it in the objects that we are consuming, in the objects that were looted from other people. So the question is how to make these objects legible in a different way, legible as uh, 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 the uh, enhanced presence of violence rather than as objects that can or should be uh, uh, discussed under the taxonomy that was given to them. Is it already too, uh, too late? So uh, I would like to show an excerpt from a film as a kind of uh, break from uh, Speaking. It's a, a black girl by Osman Semben, um, and I will say a few words about it once I'll, I'll finish the few minutes that I'm going to show. <laughs> J'ai du travail, j'ai du travail chez les Blancs, j'ai du travail, j'ai du travail, du travail, du travail chez les Blancs, du travail chez les Blancs, j'ai du travail, j'ai du travail, du travail chez les Blancs. J'ai trouvé du travail, j'ai du travail chez les Blancs. Smith and Ben, by the way. Ma mère était là, comme d'habitude. Et je lui dis que j'avais trouvé du travail chez I les Blancs. Ma mère jeta le masque et me recommanda d'être courageuse. Tu me laisses le masque et à la fin du mois, je te donnerai 50 francs. C'est pour moi Oui, madame. Is it for me Yes, madame. C'est un cadeau de la bonne. It's a gift from the maid. Et elle est authentique, dis donc. It's authentic.
I hope it's enough for you to go and watch the film. Uh, it exists with English subtitles, I'm pretty sure that also with uh, Spanish, maybe Catalan subtitles, I don't know. Uh, so the reason that I wanted to show uh, this film is not only because it's a great film, but it is also because what we see here is how uh, two taxonomies are uh, uh, get coming together. She gives a gift. She gives a gift and she expects, you know, to be treated normally. This is still in Dakar. She will be there a maid in, uh, uh, where they live uh, 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 in France in, uh, very shortly. And she's very maltreated, to say the least. They do not give her a salary. They abuse her. They give her to do works that she was not meant to do. They do not let her to do anything besides uh, being their maid. And uh, I will not tell you all the story, but uh, uh, she gives this gift as, you know, a contract in a way. And uh, when they abuse the contract, she takes it back. But before I will tell you a few words about the moment when she takes it back, uh, uh, she gives the, uh, uh, the mask. And as you saw, he appreciates it as it's valuable. It's valuable in his taxonomy. He removes it from being circulated, you know, among people. We saw her in a few minutes, but if you will watch the film, you will see uh, the role of the mask is much more important. We saw her already taking the mask from the boy. We saw her mother throwing the mask on the floor. We saw her wearing the mask. We saw her exchanging, you know, the mask for money that is not yet there with uh, 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 the young boy. So we saw the mask as part of the fabric of life. And what we see here in this moment is the removal of the mask into the wall. And from that moment all on, these are the rules, the contract that she was sure that she is initiating with uh, 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 the white uh, 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 employer, or I don't know how to call her, abuser. Uh, she thought that she is up, up to one way of understanding with her is uh, 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 completely violated when this taxonomy of those uh, 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 languages or those uh, laws that are avoiding accountability, one of the procedures that I spoke about earlier, are being put in place. Uh, here you see her, let go, it's mine. So here we see really the conflict between these two taxonomies. So when I'm speaking about imperial destruction in order to uh, impose different taxonomies, I don't want you to understand it as if it went, you know, uh, 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 without resistance. All the time it is resisted, it is still resisted now, and nothing is irretrievably lost in a way, even though many things were lost. Um, so world destruction was necessary for imperial actors who thought to inscribe their rights over other people and to craft them anew. So here you see an image from Haifa, Haifa which was apparently one of the nicest cities before 48, uh, was a mixed city, Jews and Arabs lived there together, and what you see here seems like really an image of war, right? That, wow, such a war took place there and look how the place is devastated. No, this is a planned destruction by David Ben Gurion to destroy 500 uh, dwelling, 500 sorry, structures in order to alienate Palestinians who will try to return. It was clear that they will try to return from coming back and finding their place there. So what we are seeing is not only the creation of borders, we are seeing how uh, uh, social fabrics are uh, being alienated from people who used to live there in order to impose the logic of the market, the logic of the capital, the logic of accumulation, the logic of museums, etc., etc. So destruction is constitutive in the creation of democracy. Israel was created, as you know, as democracy, for sure, until today. It is a democracy, and when I'm saying it's democracy, it's not an attempt to idealize Israel. It's to say that this is exactly what democracy is. Democracy is built on all these horrible procedures that are uh, 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 written in the common space together with this kind of uh, uh, liberal language of constitutions, laws, museums, education, etc., etc. Violent invasions and different forms of domination and colonization created a mixed body politic that consisted of colonized people and uh, colonizers. 
However, at the moment of its inception, this hybrid body politic was denied and superseded by a soon-to-be common image of the democratic body politic, consisting only of citizens, mainly European in the context of a few centuries of uh, imperialism, and in the context of Israel, Palestine, mainly Israeli Jews. And it's not that uh, six million Palestinians are not governed by the Israeli state, but they are not recognized as the body politic. They are stateless, or they are non-citizens, or they are uh, occupied people, or whatever category you encounter in relation to Palestine. Between the sea and the river, there is approximately six or seven million Jews, six or seven million Palestinians, but the body politic of the state of Israel is recognized by the state, by all the uh, civil status, as a body politic that consists of its uh, 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 mainly Jewish citizens, and uh, uh, very few comparing to the six, seven million Palestinians that live there, uh, that are considered uh, 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 also uh, citizens of the state. Uh, there has always been a tension between a seemingly disembodied body politic. This idea that the body politic consists of only of citizens is a completely disembodied idea of uh, the body politic, shaped to fit a certain desired image and set of interests of the ruling class and consisting of ideal citizens who have been bereft of any particularity and an existing heterogeneous body politic. This tension gave rise to a serious absolute differences, as uh, Edward Said called them. What made them absolute was the fact that even when individuals were granted citizenship, it was always in relation to the ideal, actually imperial, notion of citizen being a specific variation of it. The citizen continued to be uh, one who enjoyed an extra uh, of imperial rights to exercise more power. The constitution of modern democracies and of democratic discourse involves this double destruction of worlds to be replaced by new ones fabricated by imperial forces and of systems of rights and social uh, fabrics to be replaced by treaties, by uh, uh, declarations, by uh, bureaucratized governments and books of laws. The democratic discourse, the discourse about democracy has not yet acknowledged its origin in this ongoing manufacture and reproduction of these absolute differences between members of the body politic. These differences between those recognized by the sovereign imperial uh, power as members of the body politic and all the other groups have been, for, uh, all the others who have been forced to embody categories such as stateless slaves, refugees, illegal workers, irregulars, etc., etc., became the core of democratic literacy. With the same gesture, citizens, the, heirs of, the inheritors of imperial textual rights, were created alongside these other imperial entities, who are perceived as extras, as superfluous to democracy's core, people against whom citizens are authorized to act and to do with them whatever we wished. And here I'm quoting uh, Amerigo Vespucci. And uh, whereas in a, a pre manufactured body politic, rights emerge from the community as part of caring for a shared world, imperial rights are predicated on a differential body politic and instrumental in the regularization of rights over others, a regularization that naturalized the systematic destruction of diverse extant political systems, never made the objects of democratic deliberations the right to destroy. No democracy will say that it is constituted on this imperial right par excellence, which is the right to destroy that you see it here. Uh, let me illustrate this with an example from an, uh, one of the earliest texts of invasion, Vespucci's letters, written at the turn of the 15th century. In these letters, we can read the invention of those new rights that I call imperial rights under the pretext of the promotion of knowledge involved in the discovery of new worlds. At the beginning of the first of his four letters, Vespucci recounts that the people uh, his expedition encounter gave them, and I'm quoting from Vespucci, whatever was asked of them at once through, uh, 
the more out of fear than out of love, I'm quoting. This is not surprising since 22 of the people that came with Vespucci were well-armed men. Each day, Vespucci continues, and I'm quoting again, we discovered an infinite number of people and various languages until having sailed 400 leagues along the coast. We began to encounter people who did not want our friendship, I'm quoting. Shortly after, Vespucci already depicts these people as enemies. They don't want, didn't want their friendships, of course. They didn't want you know, their resources and their, to be extracted and their fabric of lives to be destroyed. Uh, so immediately after, they are treated as enemies since they stood in the way of their invaders. They prevented, and I'm quoting, our landing so that we were forced to fight with them. Vespucci and his men continued to fight against the local inhabitants who objected their invasion until they routed them and killed 150 of them. The first letter is concluded with the achievements of this expedition in the form of goods that they, and I'm quoting, uh, uh, brought back, unquote. This harvest is not described as the outcome of the existence of violence against the native inhabitants and the invaded places, but as expression of the invader's sharp eye to recognize what are the best pearls or what are the best objects. The author is proud of his connoisseurship, anticipating what would be appreciated by his sovereign, in whose name and for whose sake he exercised the right to appropriate others' wealth, resources, and labor. And I'm uh, ending the quote from uh, Vespucci. We brought back pearls and gold in the nascent or crude state. We brought back two stones. We brought back a large piece of crystal. We brought back 14 pearls the color of flesh. I'm quoting uh, uh, Vespucci. And I'm close to end. Rather than reading these texts according to linear temporality and the chronological order of the archive and, pre pre and assuming that they pertain to an early phase of, dis of the discovery of the new world, I propose to use these letters uh, uh, for reconstructing the set of imperial rights that continue to this day to lie at the basis of our democratic political regimes. Obviously, we don't have photos of Vespucci's murderous uh, adventures, but we do have access to other photographic corpuses from which we can reconstruct the reiteration of the same imperial rights to fabricate new worlds in which rights over others could be established as law, as if equal to everybody. And uh, what I'm trying to argue, and I will not you know, dwell on it more in length today, is that uh, rather than <clears throat> accepting the law of the archive and these expectations that we have to match every single image to a situation that took place, but we, don't, we cannot really struggle against imperialism if we accept the logic of imperialism that those modalities of violence are discrete violence. Rather than accepting this imperial temporality that is about discrete moments, I'm trying to work in the 500 years and to ask, what does it mean if photography was invented in 1492? So we don't have photographs from Vespucci. I have no photographs to show you from Vespucci because camera were not invented. But everything else that is related to the extraction of images from other people, to the, idea, to the constitution of this idea of the documentary, of bringing records of what you saw there was already there. So rather than accepting the temporality of uh, uh, imperialism that would tie us to the invention of photography in the 19th century related to the invention of technology, I'm trying to associate photography with imperial technologies that I uh, showed you the five main procedures of differentiating people, subjugating women to the patriarchy, extracting their resources, etc., etc. So what I'm doing is reading Vespucci and looking at these images in order to understand the imperial projects. So in, in these kind of photographs taken almost 500 years later, I am inviting you to see the exercise of the same rights. So rather than relating to photography as a technology that is associated with the device of the camera, I'm asking you to think about photography as the exercise of those imperial rights. As long as the imperial right to fabricate new worlds for and over other people 
is not rejected outright and its criminal deeds and durabilities are not acknowledged, deferred and reversed, deferred and reversed, democracy will have no other existence outside of its imperial origins. So it is not about <coughs> modifying something in democracy, it is about a complete change of understanding of democracy as an imperial project. And in this sense, Palestine is not to be created one day by the generosity of uh, the Israel, Israeli governments that destroyed Palestine, but Palestine is there. So if I can end this lecture with any uh, 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 positivistic claim, Palestine is there. You don't have to imagine that Palestine will be invented by the Israeli government. The question is how to dismantle the state apparatuses in order for Palestine that is there, inhabited by Palestinians, to exist and to exist otherwise than it exists now under uh, imperial democratic rule. Thank you.